Thank you, Kumar, for the invitation. Um, Toronto is my favorite place. It would have been much better if I was in Toronto, but it's okay. I have a request for people who are listening to me. If you're in a setting that allows you to turn on your videos, please turn it on so that it doesn't feel like I'm just speaking to an empty room, but I understand if you can't. So I will very quickly um, explain what I had talked about in the pre-talk so that just in case you were not able to watch it, uh, we're at least on the same page. So F for me will always be a number field and F infinity will be a pro P extension over my base field F. For a large part of my talk, it will be a ZP extension, in particular, even the cyclotomic ZP extension. And um, one of my favorite theorems in Iwasawa theory is um, a result of Iwasawa, which says that if you take uh, a ZP extension, uh, F infinity over F, so that just means that the Galois group of F infinity over F is isomorphic to ZP. And you look at the class number of the nth layer of this tower, and you say that, well, suppose En is the largest power of P that divides this class number, then it has this very precise form, which is mu P to the N plus lambda N plus mu, where mu lambda and mu are integers independent of uh, your choice of N. And um, as I've written down, mu and lambda are uh, non-negative and mu is any integer. And there is a conjecture of Iwasawa, which would be kind of important for us today, which says that for the cyclotomic ZP extension, this mu is uh, probably zero. That's uh, known in some cases. Uh, in particular, there is a result of Ferrero and Washington from 1979, where they proved that for uh, obedient extensions over Q, the conjecture of Ibasaba is true. And in the last uh, 40 years, uh, not much uh, more is known. Now, another aspect uh, which is going to be kind of important for us is the structure theorem of uh, lambda gamma modules. So what is uh, lambda gamma? It's called the Ibasaba algebra. Um, and because I will be talking essentially about ZP extensions, so for us, the Ivasava algebra will be isomorphic to um, a formal power series ring in one variable. And this Ivasava algebra lambda gamma is not a PID, but finitely generated lambda gamma modules have a structure theorem which resembles um, the structure theorem of PIDs. So what do I really mean by that? So if M is a finitely generated lambda gamma module, you have a pseudo isomorphism. I'll explain in a second what that is, which looks like uh, what I've written on the right-hand side. So it's lambda to the R, direct some lambda mod P to the MIs, direct some lambda mod FJs to the NJs. So by a pseudo isomorphism, I mean that there's a homomorphism from M to whatever I've written on the right-hand side with a finite kernel and finite co-kernel. So P is the fixed prime P and FJ is uh, a distinguished, irreducible distinguished polynomial. So this is a polynomial with ZP coefficients. Uh, the leading power is one and uh, sorry, the leading uh, coefficient is one and all other coefficients are um, divisible by P. And uh, for most of what I say today, uh, we will assume that R is zero. So our module will in fact be torsion lambda gamma module. And um, I can define what's called the um, characteristic ideal of my module M, which will be P to the mu. So over here, mu is uh, the sum of all these MIs times, I'm going to take a product over FJ to the NJ. And I will also be talking about the Vasava theory of elliptic curves. 
Um, so I'll fix an elliptic curve, say E over F. I will be interested in looking at the P primary part of the Selmer group. Um, so even though I'll only be looking at the P primary part, um, I will still just denote it by cell and not a cell P infinity, just to keep notations simple. And if you don't think about the Selmer group every day, you should just keep in mind that it's something that um, measures a, a local global failure. And if you think of the Selmer group in any other way, that's it's also fine. You don't have to really, this definition that I've written down is not very important. A key player, as was in my title, is the fine Selmer group. So that is a subgroup of the Selmer group. And it is something that I get from the Selmer by, imp oops, by imposing um, more vanishing conditions at primes above P. And because I will be talking about what's happening in towers, so um, I need to look at the Selmer group over F infinity, or the fine Selmer group over F infinity. And uh, these are um, obtained by taking the direct limits. And there is a conjecture of Coates and Sajata which says that the dual fine Selmer group, so taking the Pontryagin dual is something that we often have to do in Ivasava theory. So the dual of the fine Selmer group is always lambda gamma torsion. So, so knowing it's, it's known to be finitely generated um, because <clears throat> even the dual Selmer is always finitely generated. That was a result of Maser. But irrespective of the reduction type, it's always expected to be lambda gamma torsion. And you expect the mu invariant to be zero. So um, in a way, the fine Selmer group is supposed to be mimicking the class group, uh, but um, for the elliptic curves side of the story. So uh, that is just to make sure that everybody's sort of on the same page. Um, so I will now start talking about some uh, of the uh, results. So you might wonder what evidence do we have for conjecture A? So maybe before I say this, so the dual Selmer is, there are lots of examples where the dual Selmer does not have mu equal zero. So the fine Selmer having mu equal zero is um, not going to be something that will follow from a similar statement of the Selmer group. So this is something which is very particular to the fine Selmer groups. Uh, so uh, for my thesis, I uh, proved the result with uh, my co-advisor, uh, Sujata Ramadurai, which uh, is a generalization of a result of Professor Greenberg, who I see is also in the audience. Um, so the statement is as follows. It says, if F is a number field, and E over F is a ranked zero elliptic curve. And we assume that Shaw is finite. Uh, I've put a star here because you could assume something weaker, but it's just easier to state it this way. Then if you're varying over all primes of good ordinary reduction, then the Selmer over the cyclotomic extension is finite for density one primes. And what that would imply automatically is that, well, if your Selmer or your dual Selmer is finite, then your, um, yeah, so then your, if your dual Selmer or your dual Selmer is finite, then the fine Selmer is also finite and in particular uh, has mu equals zero. And therefore conjecture A would hold for density one good ordinary primes. And the way, uh, so, so Professor Greenberg had proven this for um, for f equals q, and uh, I had not seen a similar statement for uh, number fields in general. And it appears to me that there was a result of Kumar that was sort of required 
for proving this, uh, which uh, maybe a lot of Yavasava theorists were not aware of. So how do we uh, prove such a statement? So you can reduce it to showing that the characteristic ideal of the Selmer group. So we want to show that the Selmer is finite. Uh, so the so the characteristic uh, polynomial um, evaluated at zero has this form, which is pretty well known. Uh, I'll go over the terms in a second. And you want to show that this is in fact a unit. Um, if you can show it's a unit, then it will be finite. So what are the terms? So this is, oh, okay. This is the Tamagawa number, and I'm just going to look at uh, the P part of it. This is the Selmer group. Uh, this is the P part of the uh, Mordell Way group, so the P torsion points. Uh, so, uh, sorry, the P power torsion points. And E tilde is the reduced elliptic curve. Little fv is the residue field. And I'm taking the product at primes above uh, p. So the strategy. So of course, if I want to show it's a unit, it can be unit in a in many different ways. But the only way I could really attack this problem was by saying that each of these terms uh, must be a unit. So your first question might even be that: Do we know whether there are rank zero elliptic curves over f? Yes, there are. Um, it's in fact not that old the result of Mazur and Rubin where they show that there are lots of um, elliptic curves over any given number field of rank zero. And now I'm going to one by one make all the terms a unit. So um, the first thing is, well, F is a number field. So The p torsion points of um, the of e will be trivial for all but finitely many primes. Uh, by the way, I had set up the problem. The the Selmer group is in fact Shaw uh, and I've assumed that to be trivial. The Tamagawa number is uh, divisible by only certain primes. So the first term will not contribute um, uh, for all but finitely many primes. And the problem really arises for assuming it's finite, you're assuming it's finite. Yes. Uh, so it is going to be trivial for um, all but finitely many primes. And uh, maybe I should say trivial for all but finitely many. And so, yeah, the, the words, trouble the, will be these the primes. Uh, so the trouble will be over here. Um, so these, so I want that P is what we call non-anomalous. So that is equivalent to saying that P does not divide E tilde V fv and um, it, this is a result of kumar where if i'm not making a mistake he has used trebotarev density theorems and some other very analytic methods that i don't understand very well but he pointed me to this result of his that p is non-anomalous um, for um not for all but finitely many uh for for density one primes And that would uh, make my um, FE evaluated at zero 
uh, a unit for uh, uh, for density one good ordinary primes. And um, so, yeah, that would conclude the proof. And yes, it is true that even if these conditions are not satisfied, the fine Selmer group can be finite over the cyclotomic extension. So this theorem is in a way just giving you a lower bound. You expect it to be finite in maybe like many, many more cases, but I unfortunately do not have a way to prove that at the moment. Um, okay, so there are a few other places where you can prove uh, the um, uh, proof conjecture A. So for that, I need to uh, explain what is uh, a p-rational number field. Could I, have a, could I ask a question? Um, sure. I mean, um, would you expect um, the summer group to be zero? I mean, yes. Uh, so in a, in a large number of cases, it is actually zero. Right, but I mean, um, if it's finite, can it be finite and not zero? The Selmer, I, I want to say that it will always be trivial, but I will still be a little cautious. I think that's what you have proven in your Chatrara volume, but I, I don't remember the exact statement. So, I, I think so maybe, so maybe I would very cautiously say that uh, but I, I'll put a star there because I need to, um, I need to uh, make sure that I'm not missing any hypothesis. But uh, so for P rational number fields, okay. So again, F is a number field. I'm going to write SP for the set of primes above P and F. And FSP is the maximal P ramified extension of F. And this will be the maximal pro P quotient of, um, will be the number field corresponding to the maximal pro P quotient FSP over F. Okay, now what is a P rational number field? So this was defined by Nguyen Kuang Do and Mova Hedi, and they said that a number field F is P rational if um, the Galva group of FSP P over P is a free pro P group. Uh, I'm going to write this for simplicity as GSP of F. And they gave lots of examples of P-rational number fields, but all their examples were abelian. So some examples are, well, Q is a P-rational number field and imaginary, quadra uh, sorry, a quadratic field is P-rational um, if P does not divide the class number of K. If P is a regular prime, then Q mu P is P rational. So Q mu, uh, so by P regular, I mean that again, P does not divide the class number of Q mu P. So these are all abelian examples. Now in 2017, um, 
Jishnu Ray and Barbalesco actually were able to computationally construct um, non-abelian p-rational number fields. So that was sort of interesting. And something that I had not seen written down in the literature, but is not very hard to prove, is that if f is a p-rational number field, then the classical Levasaba mu equals zero conjecture is in fact true. So this also gives us examples of um, non-abelian number fields over Q where the classical Levasaba mu equals zero conjecture holds. And uh, the, 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 the proof is really simple. You just have to translate this whole idea into um, a cohomological setting and that an equivalent statement of the classical conjecture is a vanishing of the second Galva cohomology group. You can write it that way. And then it's the definition of p-rationality just fits into it and, and you can show the classical conjecture. But what that also means is that I hadn't said this I haven't said this yet, but there is a very interesting result of uh, Coates and Sajata from 2005 and reproven by Meng Fai Lim and Kumar Murthy in 2016, where they show that if E uh, is an elliptic curve and you assume that at least over the base field, um, it has all the P division points, um, not the P, sorry, it has the P torsion points, then Conjecture A is, is equivalent to the Ivasaba mu equals zero conjecture. So this is a very interesting statement, at least to me. And this is telling you that the Feinselmer group and the class groups are in fact behaving very, very similarly, at least in the cyclotomic extension. And the, the result on P rational number fields can therefore be uh, used to now say something about conjecture A in a setting where it was again, not known before. And this proof is again, fairly simple. So maybe I'll sketch it um, very quickly. So I'm assuming that F contains mu P. Um, this is not a very strict condition. Firstly, um, and, but even before maybe I say that, I should say that uh, Professor Greenberg has conjectured that if you have a number field F, it should be P rational outside, as it should be a P rational for density one primes. Um, there are heuristic reasons to believe it. I am not aware if, a lot of work has been done in this direction yet, but there's a paper from 2016 where Professor Greenberg does give heuristic reasons to believe why uh, the statement should be true. Uh, and so th the way you would go about proving the corollary is well, F contains mu P. So uh, the way pairing would essentially tell you that Um, right, maybe I, I, I don't want to say it this way. Yeah, so I've assumed EFP is not zero, F contains mu P. So by the way pairing, I know that F E bracket P over F is a degree P extension or it's trivial. And now I can um, use this uh, result of uh, Coates and Sujata or Kumar Murthy to um, uh, Meng Fai Lim and Kumar Murthy to um, conclude that conjecture A must be true 
for, well, I, I probably did not write this. This is the notation for the dual fine Selmer. So conjecture A was a statement about the, the dual fine Selmer. So now this result automatically gives us conjecture A. Right. So once I looked at these results, I was like, okay, so over the cyclotomic extension, we are seeing that the class groups and the fine Selmer groups are behaving very, very similarly. But what about other ZP extensions? Or what about other, um, other pro-piatic uh, analytic extensions? In fact, what about other non-piatic analytic extensions? And um, you, you can prove um, results where you, you can show that the fine Selmer group is growing very similar to the class group in all these settings. Um, but one result that I would probably like to point out is um, something of, uh, for what's almost uh, an anti-cyclotomic ZP extension. So Ivasava had proven so Ivasava conjectured that over the cyclotomic tower, the mu invariant, the classical mu invariant should be zero. But in 1973, he was able to show that if you're not looking at the cyclotomic tower, if you're looking at some other towers, it is possible that your mu invariant becomes arbitrarily large. So I was interested in trying to see if the fine Selmer group's mu invariant could become arbitrarily large as well. Um, so, um, in fact, in fact, I was able to prove a result which was in the spirit of the result which was proven uh, by Ivasava in 1973. So, I'm going to take a very simple setting. Um, you you can generalize this further. Again, elliptic curves are not really required. These statements are all true for abelian varieties in general, but I, I just like to explain things for elliptic curves. So F is um, the cyclotomic field of pth roots of unity. So that's just Q zeta P or Q mu P. Uh, maybe I'll make this a little larger. And again, I have to assume that uh, over my base field, it has um, P torsion points. And the statement is that you can find a degree P extension which over which you can have a ZP extension such that the mu is arbitrarily large. And this choice of L uh, will depend on the N that you give me. And how, how can we prove this? So, so F was Q mu P. F plus, I'm going to let that be the notation for the maximal totally real subfield. So this is uh, degree two. And I'm going to take um, primes L plus not above P in F plus, which remain inert when you go up to F. And once I've, okay, so Chebotarev density theorem will tell us that there are infinitely many such primes. And you can show using some uh, group theory that over the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension, well, I haven't told you what that is, so maybe I'll say that in a second. So over the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension, all these primes are going to be completely split. So the anti-cyclotomic ZP extension is, uh, is a very particular ZP extension uh, over a uh, number field such that uh, it is, so every layer Fn is in fact Galva over F plus, and this Galva group is non-abelian. It is the dihedral group of 2n elements. So 
unlike the, so this is very, very different from the cyclotomic extension. Um, and the, maybe one point that I should make is that um, the, the cyclotomic extension, all primes were, uh, had finite splitting. So when you went up to the cyclotomic extension, if you looked at how many primes were there above any given rational prime, uh, there were always only finitely many. But over here, over the anticyclotomic one, there are infinitely many primes which, uh, which split completely when you go up to this anticyclotomic tower. And that is going to be a very, very important part of this con construction. Uh, and in uh, proving this sort of a result. So I'm going to choose eta to be an element in F cross, which is divisible exactly by the first. Okay, so maybe uh, maybe before I say that, okay, uh, of L i, where, so L plus when they go up to F, I'll call them L. And I said there are infinitely many which will remain inert there. So I'm going to choose M many of them. Okay. And I'm going to define L to be F a joint P. Eta, the pth root of eta, and ln will therefore just be the compositum of fn and l. So l infinity is no longer an anticyclotomic tower uh, because anticyclotomic tower has a very sp specific definition. So I'm not going to call it an anticyclotomic tower, uh, but it is still uh, it's it's still a non-cyclotomic tower and primes are going to be splitting completely um, in L infinity. So um, there are lots of primes in L where primes would be splitting completely in L infinity just because they're splitting completely in F uh, anticyclotomic. And now in order to prove uh, this result, something that you have that you can show is that the FP rank of the fine Selmer group over uh, the, yeah over ln. So this is the p rank of the fine Selmer group. So you're just looking at um, how many z mod p copies are there. This is greater than equal to a constant which is either going to be one or two times. The class group of uh, Ln, you're looking at the p rational points of that, minus another constant. I'm going to write it as c bad. I'll tell you why I've written bad here. Uh, so there's a p to the n minus c bad p to the n. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. There is no p to the n here. That, that's going to come from um, my dimension. OK. So I've written c bad here because this constant just depends on the number of bad primes that uh, my elliptic curve has. And proving this inequality is um, not very difficult, but it requires some work. So you cannot prove this inequality directly. You have to, uh, so you cannot compare the fine Selmer group and the class group on their own. Uh, that's kind of hard. What you end up doing is that you compare the fine Selmer group with a subgroup called the S fine Selmer group. And uh, that's related essentially to the S class group. So th that's like the class group, but your um, pr primes in S, which is a finite set, are splitting completely. So they're not just unramified, they're splitting completely. And you, you're able to compare those two objects, which gives you um, this inequality that you want. And now 
And so maybe I should write this as one or two. And now, um, so this, this, is a, this is an absolute constant. Using class field theory, and in particular, what we call uh, Chevalier's um, ambiguous class number formula, you can write this dimension, uh, uh, the FP dimension of the class group precisely. And this is going to be bigger than equal to m p to the n. So this is where the m comes in. So this is always bigger than equal to the number of primes that are going to be splitting completely in the um, in ln. And it depends on the degree of the extension. So ln over L itself uh, has degree p to the n. Um, so I, don't, I did not really care about what was the degree of L over Q, but that also sort of comes in. So these are the number of primes in ln over L that are, uh, so that you have, um, at least these many uh, primes are there um, above. Uh, yeah, so maybe I didn't say this. Yeah, so M was the number of primes that were splitting completely. So at ln you have M P to the N many um, uh, primes that you were looking at. And this M, is something that you chose. And you could take it to be as large as you wanted it to be because there were like, M can be arbitrarily large. So that allows you to choose a capital L such that your final group is as large as you want it to be. Um, because this object uh, is, yeah, so the mu invariant of the fine Selmer group is going to be bigger than equal to this object. And you have uh, that is bigger than equal to mp to the n, and you have control over this m. So again, this proof is very much in the spirit of uh, how Ivasava had proven his uh, theorems, uh, his, his theorem as well. On, um, on on class groups. So maybe because I'm sort of low on time, I'm not going to give the proof of the next result, and but I'll just say it in words, which is in a very similar way. Um, it was um, yeah, so there's a <clears throat> maybe before I talk about my results. So uh, it was pointed out to me that Hajir and Mer in 2019 published a paper where they extended the work of Ivasava. They, they proved that the, the key point in proving a result like this was the fact that the primes were splitting completely. So Hajir and Mer showed, uh, I'll not write it down very technically. So there's a, so they showed that there exists a large class of pro P group G such that you can construct Um, a G extension over a base field F of your choice, there is some restriction on the choice, but for now, let's say over F of your choice, such that um, there exist infinitely many primes in F, that split completely in this G extension. So in F infinity over F, where now F infinity is this G extension over F. So, 
so they proved what I would call like an Ivasava type result, but in a in a large uh, for a large class of G. And in fact, the the outline that I gave for this anticyclotomic type ZP extension can be extended, and you can in fact show that the fine Selmer group. Oh, so okay, so so they they proved this, and then they were also able to show that uh, an Ivasava type result holds. So uh, the mu becomes arbitrarily large in such a G extension. And uh, yeah, you can also do the same thing for the fine Selmer groups. Of course, now you're not working with an obedient extension necessarily anymore, so you have to be a little more careful, but, but the idea remains the same. So you can prove, uh, again, like lots and lots of examples where you're, you're able to drive home the fact that the fine Selmer group is very similar to the class group, which, um, which is very fascinating, at least, at least for me. Now, for the last 10 minutes that I have, I want to switch gears and talk about how the um, fine Selmer group is also somehow very similar to the Selmer group as you would probably expect it. Um, so a very important class of problems in, um, in the Vasava theory, or at least the Vasava theory of elliptic curves and obedient varieties are these control theorems. And um, this was first, the, the first case of uh, the control theorem was proven by Mazur in his fundamental paper uh, from 1972. Um, but so what is the problem? So the problem says, well, you're looking at, again, let's think very simply that F infinity is just a ZP extension. And you're looking at a finite nth layer of this extension. So in an ideal world, you would probably want this restriction map to be an isomorphism, but this is not an ideal world. So good things always don't happen even if you want them to be. Uh, so, and so there is a kernel, there is a co-kernel, but what um, Mazur proved was that for ZP extensions, when your elliptic curve, so, uh, so your elliptic curve is uh, over your base field F, it has good ordinary reduction at P, and P is not equal to two. Um, the kernel and the co-kernel are finite and bounded independent of N. And then in 2003, Professor Greenberg uh, proved that uh, this result is not true just for ZP extensions, but it can be extended to a large class of uh, periodic V extensions. Uh, I don't want to write down all the cases where uh, this theorem has been proven, um, but so uh, maybe what I want to say again over here. So over here also, you need to assume that your elliptic curve has potential good ordinary reduction at P. And because now you're working with fairly general periodic V extensions, you are able to prove in a large number of cases that the kernel and co-kernel are finite, but um, it need not be bounded. In fact, there are lots of cases um, that are pointed out in that paper where the co-kernel will not be bounded for sure. Um, and what we wanted to study was 
what happens for fine settlement groups. And so maybe before I, so the, the, the problem is still the same. Now you're looking at the map, the restriction map, um, Galva F infinity over Fn. Uh, very quickly, I will start writing this object as um, Gn, but for now, uh, it's fine. And this was first studied by Ruben for uh, some ZPD extensions. So these are multiple uh, multi ZP extensions and he required the condition that primes are finitely split in these uh, multi ZP extensions, but there was no condition on the reduction type um, at primes above P. And then in 2004, uh, probably um, Woodrich uh, proved this for all ZP extensions, not just uh, the ZP extensions. Uh, so worked on this problem. I'll tell you what, what they proved. Um, so he worked on this problem for all ZP extensions, not just those where uh, primes are finitely split. So Woodridge was able to prove that the kernel and co-kernel of Rn are finite and bounded. So this is again, very similar to the result of Maser. where you're looking at what's happening for ZP extensions and you're e able to show that the kernel and co-kernel are bounded. Um, when uh, Ruben was working with ZPD extensions, uh, he was able to show that it is finite, but he was not able to show bounded as far as I know. Um, in, uh, yeah, so, so he was able to prove finite but he was not able to show boundedness. And what I studied over the summer with uh, Meng Fai Lim was trying to basically prove this in um, greater generality, uh, trying to see what happens in non-obedient extensions. And uh, before I probably just show you uh, the results that we got, I'll tell you what's the uh, what's the general approach of solving this sort of a question. So you write down the, oh, this is, okay, maybe I should do this. So you write down the definitions and you, you do a diagram chase. So you want to study the kernel and the co-kernel of Rn. You would want to therefore study the kernel and co-kernel of Gn and the kernel of Hn. And then you can use a snake lemma sort of an argument and um, get the information that you want. Um, generally, working with this global map, Gn, is not too bad. Um, you get fairly precise uh, results um, and that allows you to get a good estimate on how large your kernel of Rn will be. But the local uh, study is often very hard. Now, uh, if you remember the first, uh, like from, from the recall page that I had, the fine Selmer group and the Selmer group essentially only differ at um, primes above P. So everything, that Greenberg had done in his 2003 paper for primes not above P would 
go through for our case. Um, but we would still have to do the analysis at P, which is um, always kind of the harder um, uh, thing to do. So that's one of the things that uh, that we that we still had to study. So our problem was not just um, translating Greenberg's problem to our case. And the other thing that we did was uh, we tried to actually get uh, estimates uh, on the uh, size of the kernel and the co-kernel. So not just say that they're finite or finite uh, and bounded, but if it's bounded, it's great. Um, but in cases where we were only able to show finiteness, we, we tried to get what, uh, what are the bounds. So maybe I will just um, say that, uh, again, we did not have to put any restrictions on reduction types at uh, primes above P, at least for most of our results. Um, so we have one very general result. So there is, so we do not put any conditions. And in that case, we're not even able to show finiteness of the kernel or the co-kernel, uh, but we, we do have, like we are able to uh, say something about how large the kernel and uh, co-kernel can be. But when you start looking at specific extensions, extensions that we normally tend to care about a little more, like multiple ZP extensions or uh, what we call trivializing extensions. So those are extensions that you get by adjoining the P power division points. Um, you can actually, um, you can get pretty, uh, pretty okay estimates uh, so maybe I will just talk about one of them uh, and leave the rest for you to stare at in, in, if you want. So for ZPD extensions, uh, we are able to show that if you do not have any hypothesis on the reduction type at primes above P, then the kernel is growing like a big O of N. But if it's a good ordinary reduction, then it's in fact a big O of one. You, if you have more information about the ZPD extension, which you do, for example, if you are in, uh, if you're looking at a ZP2 extension for CM elliptic curves, then, then you're often able to get more information. Um, and similarly, you have um, the a growth result for, the co-kernel, but what's kind of interesting is that once, so you might want to say that, well, okay, these uh, like these are not very precise, but in a way they're still good enough maybe because uh, what you probably really want to do is see how the fine Selmer group is growing up the tower. So now if you go back to this diagram, you will see that uh, well, you have estimated the kernel and the co-kernel and the results of Kuoko and Monsky, which tell us uh, how this guy is growing uh, in a ZPD extension, for example. And that order, if I am not making a mistake is um, either a big O of P to the D minus one N or a big O of P to the D N. Um, so, so the point being that even though our co-kernel estimates are not necessarily the, the best estimates, it is still good enough for us to get uh, an estimate of how the fine Selmer group is gr growing at, in, in the sense that we're still able to say that it's growing as fast as your, um, as fast as this guy. So the, the kernel and the co-kernel are um, not contributing a lot. Uh, maybe, maybe I will stop here. 
Okay, thank you, Devanjana. I think there's a, in those who understand these things, there's a way to put a reaction on oh, here it is. Yes, sitting up like that. Okay, good. <laughs> good, nice talk. Uh, are there any comments uh, or questions? I, I do have a uh, question now. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, going back to the psychotomic ZP extension of a number of fields and conjecture A, um, um, you didn't mention anything about the lambda invariant. Um, can you say something about the lambda invariant? It, it might be interesting. Um, the lambda invariant um, estimates final. are generally harder, and I do have some results on them, but maybe I don't want to say anything on the record. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, for example, um, can it be positive? Um, I mean, that, that's a question. I would say so. I, I think it can be positive. Okay. Okay, so this is work in progress, huh? It, any other comments or questions? Um, Armand, you had a question in the um, chat, and I don't know the answer to. Uh, that was a question at the very beginning of a talk. It mm -hmm. was whether one knew anything more than the Washington Fer Ferrero uh, about the number field situation. Mm -hmm. So that was, that's has very little to do with the current. No, talk. that's okay. But it's an interesting comment. I don't know. Somebody maybe not may know I, the I answer. I think I think there are results of. Lila Schnapps and uh, Gillard, where they show that there exists uh, what's called the split prime ZP extensions over imaginary quadratic fields, where wow. um, the uh, mu where the mu is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. But you would but, and whether... again like. Uh, there is uh, so something which is very uh, interesting about that extension is that primes are um, finitely uh, split. A prime, yeah, primes do not split completely. So there are only finitely many primes above any given prime. 